Hey, what's up? It's Jared with Ditch Auto, and today we're going to talk about this top settings that I change on my RX100 Mark 7. Of course, this is a new camera. I just got it in, and this is what I do when I get a camera. I change some settings, and uh, you know, it's a fun day when you get a new camera. I'm actually excited about this little camera. Even though I had the previous version of it, I think that there are some things that I'm really going to like, like the zero blackout on the display, being able to shoot images so fast, and I'm just excited to be able to get to spend some time with the camera and bring back my thoughts and share them with all of you. So make sure to click the subscribe button on the channel because I will be putting out some content on this little camera soon. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw uh, my battery in it. Hopefully this battery is charged at least a little bit. If it's not, no big deal because I can just grab a battery out of my other camera. So I'm gonna go ahead and power it on. And the first thing that you're gonna wanna do, even though it's super exciting and you wanna jump right through it, is set the date and time and the appropriate time zone for your camera. Because if you don't do this, you're gonna end up having issues with those photos when you go and upload them to services like Google Photos or whatnot. It's not gonna have your photos uh, organized or situated very well, and it's just gonna be frustrating. So for me, I go ahead and customize all of this stuff so I don't have to deal with the frustrations that will come later on. Now, before I jump in, there's a couple other things that I do. The first thing is to put my camera in manual manual mode. Now this little camera is absolutely awesome, but one of the reasons that you would spend this kind of money is so that you get the pro controls that you deserve, and you're not going to get those unless you shoot in manual mode. Of course, there are aperture and shutter priority modes, which are good, but for me, I prefer using full manual mode so that I can control the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO all independently and make sure that I get the exposure that I'm looking for, not that the camera thinks is best. So the next thing is actually to format your SD card in the camera. This is a new camera, and even if you're coming from another Sony, I think it's important once you make sure that everything is off that SD card to put the SD card in the camera and format it in camera. Don't format your SD cards in other cameras and then put it in here. Don't format your SD cards on your computer and then put it in here. You're going to get the best longevity in life and just the best experience overall if you format your card in the camera. Because I do that, I don't have issues with corrupt images or issues with the SD card becoming unreadable because I just handle formatting right inside the camera the way that it was designed to be in the first place. All right, so let's jump into these settings. The first thing I do is go into the menu and change the file format to RAW plus JPEG. Now, the reason that I do that is because I want that RAW image. This camera is great, but there's gonna be some things that are little limitations to it because of its size, and I wanna make sure that I'm getting the most out of the image that I'm shooting. That means with the RAW file, I can go and take it into an editor and have a lot more room for pulling back details and all that stuff. If a photo was overexposed, I can pull it back if it was underexposed, I could bump it up. I can color correct much better with a raw image. Now, the reason that I would shoot JPEGs also is for when I want to transfer images from my camera to my smartphone. The raw images are quite large and the transfer time is going to take a bit longer. So if you're going to want to transfer a bunch of images over to your smartphone for the purposes of sharing them with others or sharing them on social media, having the JPEGs available is going to make that process much quicker. Now, of course, when you do copy them over, it will convert the RAW to a JPEG for you, but that's additional processing time, wear and tear on your battery and all that stuff, and it just takes more time. Shooting RAW plus JPEG saves you time, essentially. Now, I also like shooting RAW plus JPEG because if there is an instance where one of your RAW images becomes corrupt for some reason, uh, maybe it's through a conversion process or something, something happens to that RAW image, you at least have the JPEG as a backup. And I've had this happen to me before, which is why I continue continuously shoot RAW plus JPEG. You don't necessarily have to, but because there's only one card slot in here and you can't be writing your images to two different SD cards, you can only do whatever you can. And RAW plus JPEG, at least it gives me a little bit of a backup in case an image file did get corrupt. Of course, if your SD card has issues in and of itself, you're out of luck there. But 
let's just try and do as much as we can to prevent problems. I shoot RAW plus JPEG so that I could prevent that. Setting number two is I customize my autofocus settings. Now, autofocus by default is going to utilize the entire viewable area that the sensor has in any point possible. And this camera has a lot of them and the autofocus is really great. It's one of the things that is being promoted as an amazing piece of technology in this camera is its autofocus abilities. But for me, autofocus just doesn't always get it right. Now, I autofocus is something that's really great in situations where there's only one person or one pet in your image and there's only a set of eyes. But if you have multiple people and they're on different plane levels, sometimes you want to choose a person to be the focal point, uh, choose a subject or whatnot. And I autofocus more often than not gets it wrong and it's just not consistent. And when you don't have an opportunity to just continuously take the shot over and over again, it's important to make sure that you set the autofocus point yourself. So I go into the function menu here, slide over to focus area, and then go down to flexible spot. And I usually leave it on M for medium. What that allows me to do is actually tap and position the focus wherever I want it, or I can actually tap from left to right and up and down on the wheel over here and then in the center to apply that focus change and now it's locked into that position. What that allows me to do is frame up my shot the way that I want it and put the focus point where I want it to be. What's nice about the touch screen on the back is that it actually makes that really easy for me just to tap into position. Of course, there is a really nice EVF on this camera and in brighter situations, I will use the EVF, but in most cases with a camera of this size, I'm using the back screen and it makes it really easy for me just to tap into a focus point. And I like doing that as opposed to just having the entire screen available um, and letting the camera do all the work itself. I do this on pretty much every camera because none of them are perfect. They can't read my mind and they're often missing the shot and then I miss an opportunity and nothing feels worse to me than going through all my images and having having to delete many of them because they're shots that just the focus wasn't in the right spot. It's not that the camera failed to get focus, it just failed to get focus where I wanted it to be. And I would rather force the camera to choose a position and I can move it around the screen and choose that position myself. Number three is setting the creative style to neutral. Now, creative style basically applies to your JPEG images. And because I'm often moving my JPEG images from my camera over to my smartphone to edit, I would rather have that image be a little bit more flat. And I don't want the creative addition that the camera throws on that image. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you're gonna want as much out of that image as you can. And if it adds a bunch of like contrasting and stuff like that to the image, when you move it over to your smartphone, to edit, you're not going to have all of that available. Now, of course, you can move raw images over from your camera to your smartphone, so you can just edit the raw images, but those are bigger files. They'll clog up your phone if you don't have a ton of storage. I would rather just have that JPEG image be a little bit more neutral. So I changed the creative style down from standard to neutral. And you could even go to clear, but I, I clear doesn't really work for me. I found that neutral is a little less contrasty, and that makes it much easier for me to go and apply the changes in some form of a, of a photo editing app. So even if you're just taking your images straight into Instagram and making your changes in there by applying a filter or something like that, the filter is gonna look much better applied to a neutral color style image as opposed to standard because it's gonna have more contrast room to play with. It's not gonna be stacking contrast on top of contrast. So I recommend moving that over to neutral. Moving over in the menu into movie mode, I always go and set the file format to 4K. I've been shooting everything in 4K for a few reasons. Number one is that it just future proofs my content and things that I'm filming. And the next is that when people are viewing content, most of the time now it's on something that is higher resolution than standard HD. So I want my content to come through as clear as possible. And so anything that I'm shooting in video, I definitely shoot in 4K. And then I move down to record settings and set it to 30p. 100M. I want the uh, highest quality file that I can get. And so I want that depth and that rate to be set higher. I want the 30P because I can, of course, slow it down to 24P if I want. You can't really do much with slow-mo with 30P footage, but you have a little bit of room if you edit in 24P and you shoot in 30P. Of course, if you're going to want those higher frame rates uh, for slow motion, you're going to need to stay in 
HD. You can go all the way up to 120 uh, P, which is great for slow motion, um, but you have to stay in HD for that. I opt to shoot in 4K and just forego getting some of that slow motion goodness that this camera is actually really good at. Now, the next settings that I change have to do with the control wheel on the back. Now, Sony has made some updates over the years and has started to remap buttons and make them operate different that actually works a little bit better for me. But because I shoot with higher end Sony cameras as well, such as the A7 line of cameras, the control wheel over to the right actually controls ISO. And on this camera, it controls flash settings. Since I rarely ever use the flash and when I do, I don't really change the settings. I would rather actually push over to the right and have that activate my adjustment of ISO. Now to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and go down to number four, which is flash mode. And instead of it being flash mode, I'm gonna to toggle over and get to ISO and set ISO as number four. So that way when I'm in the camera, I could just press over to the right and then start to adjust my ISO. I like that much better even though by default the trash can is mapped to ISO, which makes it nice because you could just tap the trash can and then tap to uh, uh, rotate to adjust your ISO. But because I'm so used to it being a certain way on my a7 III and my uh, soon-to-be a7R IV, I'm definitely going to set up this camera the same because muscle memory is muscle memory and I don't want to have to do different things for different cameras. If you're going to change things the way that I did, that leaves the ISO function set to the right and also to the trash can and you don't necessarily need that. So now you can take the trash can and remap it to something else. So look through all the different settings that are available there and decide for yourself what you think would be most useful. The next setting is to change your audio signals to shutter only. Now the camera uses a audible shutter noise to initiate shutter to let you know that you took a photo, but it also has a beep for a lot of different things like for when you achieve focus. So when you press the shutter button down a little bit and the camera achieves focus, it beeps. To me, that's a distraction, not only to me, but to whoever I'm taking a photo of, that beep, and if you're continuously pressing that button down and the camera's beeping, people think that you're doing something, that you're taking a picture, when you're really not yet ready to take a picture. And so just disabling that altogether just totally makes sense to me, just to remove the distraction altogether. Your camera is gonna give you visual signals that you have achieved focus. So for me, I don't need that audible signal. I think it's kind of annoying to have that audible beep. I would rather just utilize the uh, screen showing me all together by itself. When I press it down, the box turns green. That's all that I need to know that I've achieved focus. So change your audio signal to shutter only. So earlier on in the video, we changed our camera over to manual mode just by rotating the dial. Now you need to do the same thing for video. I think video is gonna be best if you just manually control. And of course that means understanding video settings they are a little bit different than where you would set up your camera for shooting photos. But you need to go into that video setting on the rotated dial here, then hit the menu button, and then toggle over to exposure mode, which is under the second pane at the top. By default, it's set to program auto, and you're gonna need to go just basically up one or all the way down to the bottom of the list and set it to manual exposure. That's gonna allow you to customize your shutter exposure ISO or ISO for both your photos and your video independently. One setting that has always helped me with getting my shot composed well is putting the rule of thirds grid line on. There are some different settings here for the grid lines. You have rule of thirds grid, square grid, and diagonal plus square grid. I set it to rule of thirds because it puts nice crosshairs across my screen. It makes it very easy for me to line things up and make sure that I get my image composed the best I can in camera so I don't have to do a bunch of cropping later. Anytime that I can get the shot right in camera without having to do any more work is great. It saves me time. It means that I can share my image much faster and it's an all around win for everybody. Now the next setting I change is turning auto review of your image on to two seconds. Now the reason I like this is because when I shoot an image, I want a preview back of that image, whether it be through the EVF or on the back of the display. And by default, the camera just prepares to shoot another photo, which is fine. And of course, this camera is meant to take photos really quickly, but all I have to really do to get back to shooting photos is just press the shutter button down a little bit again. Um, and if I'm continuously shooting by holding the shutter button down, it's not trying to give me a review of that image. It knows that I'm trying to continuously shoot photos. But when I'm done, when I take 
take my photo, I want to look at the back of the screen or through the EVF and see the review of that image for about two seconds without having to hit the playback button and go and look at that image. So for me, I turn auto review on and I put it at two seconds. So for when you are using the pop-up EVF, it's really nice to be able to move that focus point around with your thumb on the back of the display. Basically what I mean by that is you, when you're shooting, using the EVF, looking through the camera, which means the screen is gonna be turned off on the back, you can put your thumb on the screen and drag it around and move the focus point around just the same way that you would use like a trackpad on your computer to move the cursor around. This saves a ton of time and makes it much easier, but you do need to set up the camera camera in order to do that. So you're going to go under uh, setup three and down halfway is touch panel slash pad. By default, it's set to touch panel only. We're going to go ahead and change it to touch panel plus pad. From there, that turns on the touch pad settings right underneath it. We're going to go ahead and uh, leave the vertical orientation set to on. We're going to leave touch position mode set to relative. And because of the way that I use the camera, I'm going to leave it set to the right half. Now, I typically am holding this camera like like this. I have my hand kind of cupped underneath it and I would use my right thumb to move that focus point around. If you hold the camera more like this, you might actually want to use your left thumb and so you can actually change that operation area to the left half of the screen. The reason that it splits it up like that is because if you are using the EVF, part of your face is going to be covering it up. And for me, I would run into my nose if I tried to go further than beyond the uh, end of the left half of the screen. So it's just much easier to leave it set to the right half, but it does give you all sorts of options from whole screen to upper portions, lower portions, because depending on how you hold the camera, whether you're a left or a right eye, uh, you know, and looking through your EVF, you might want to set that up differently. Uh, I like it set to right half. I think that works best for me. Next, we're going to set the copyright data information in your camera to protect your images. The reason that you would want to do this is because we're uploading and sharing our images and all different ways these days and when you share an image you want the copyright data which is like your name and whatever copyright message you want to attach to that in the image. Now by default from the camera, I put my name and then I put all rights reserved in the copyright information. And then if I share that image and somebody happens to grab that image and think about using it, at least my copyright information is in that image. Now if I give somebody permission to use an image, that's fine. But there's been many times that I found my images used without my permission somewhere else. And uh, if you're not a professional shooter, you might not be thinking that that's a problem. But what if you took a picture of your children shared that image to social media, and then some blog decided to use that to promote their product. That has happened to me in the past, and I was very frustrated. All I had to do was request that they take the image down because of the copyright that was written to the image, and that was enough. Me speaking that language and saying the word copyright was enough to get them to take it down. Uh, there's, of course, more that goes into copyright protecting your images, but in most cases, that's going to be enough to get a person to pull an image down if they so happen to use your image without your permission. Now the last thing I change is actually the prefix on the file name and the reason that I started doing this is because uh, when it comes to the actual image files and I'm sending them over to my smartphone, I don't have the opportunity to rename them in that process of transferring them over. So I end up with all these images that start with DSC and I don't necessarily remember which camera they came off of and all that stuff. So I typically change the file name prefix from DSC to something specific to this camera. And that way I know which camera it came off of without having to go into the EXIF data. There may be a better reason for you as to why to change this. And if it doesn't really matter because you just import your images and rename the files anyways, by all means, just leave it alone. But for me, I found it easier just to go ahead and do that. And that way I know whether the image came off of this camera or another camera. I don't have to bother with going and digging through the EXIF data in order to know that. Uh, another thing that it helps me with is just sorting my images. I can sort my images and I know where they came from based on that prefix. And I guess that's really important to me because I'm shooting with a lot of different cameras all the time. It might not be that important to you. So if you find another reason why you might want to rename the pre prefix from DSC to something else, then great. Share that with me down in the comment section below.
So that's going to do it for this video on the top settings to change on your Sony RX100 Mark 7. A lot of these settings apply to previous versions of the camera as well, and I have done videos specific to previous cameras here. If you're still thinking about purchasing this camera, you haven't made that decision yet, I'll have more information to share with all of you on this camera as I have some time to spend with it. I'm going to do my first shots video, which I'm actually going to have to rename because YouTube demonetized my videos for using the word shots because maybe they think it's gun related, but it's really not. But what? <laughs> whatever. Um, but anyways, I do these first shot videos where I share the initial images and my experiences with the camera. I'll be putting out that video and then I'll come back and do a full review of the camera itself to let you know what I think about it whether it's worth the premium price and all of that stuff, and maybe uh, you know just the good use cases that you might find for it. So if you're interested in that, click that subscribe button, click the like button if you like this video. And if you wanna learn more about shooting images and shooting in manual mode, make sure to check out that free course that I provide called Ditch Auto, Unlocking Manual Photography. The link is down in the description below for you, along with links to this camera, the SD card that I use, extra battery, the case that I've been using for ages to hold this camera, as I've moved through different variations of the RX100. So make sure to check out those links. By clicking on them, you help support the channel here. But that's going to do it. So thanks so much for this video. I hope to see you back here in the next one. Take care.